Bloomsburg, you don't need to know this, but I'm just letting you know that when we talk about performance class, we are talking about successively more solid, heavy duty, and robust products. And, uh, and this is something we haven't been able to define before that we are now able to define through NAFs if we wish to take advantage of that property. So implications of this is that products must be sold and labeled as belonging to a performance class. They must, if they are labeled as belonging to a performance class, they must be identical in every respect except the glass to the test specimen that achieved that designation, regardless of whether those features are needed to meet code design loads. So if someone specifies an AW window for a building in Vancouver, unless that building's 30 stories tall, it probably doesn't need to be designed to those high pressures. The design pressure will probably be quite a bit lower than the AW test pressure. So these products would be then over-designed for the market, but that is what makes them solid and heavy duty. Products may therefore may have more reinforcing and hardware than needed to meet project wind loads. So can some implications here, they define categories of product that did not exist before in Canada. They differentiate products on the basis of progressively severe physical tests. Um, it also influences frame material. For all intents and purposes, an AW product will be made of aluminum because the tests are so severe that that's the only way you'll pass them all. It also influences cost. You'll see significant cost increases from one class to the next, especially as you go up to LC, CW, and AW. So you're going from somewhere to $15 or $20 a square foot to maybe $100 or $120 a square foot or more. And so it's nice to say, well, I'd like, I'm going to go for the best. I'm going to specify CW. I'm going to specify AW. Just be prepared that the costs will be probably double than what you're paying for a residential window. And is that appropriate for the kind of project you're dealing with? So over-specifying can be costly. So that's performance class. We've talked about performance grade, kind of combining our B and C ratings, but we also specify our water penetration independently of performance grade. We've talked about performance class. So these are new concepts that now you're going to go away, dream about it at night and never forget, right? Let's look at another implication of this standard, and that's new requirements for product labeling. And NAFS introduces some new terminology called a primary designator. And the primary designator is your product class. Oops. Product class, performance grade, and size tested. This is the minimum information in something called a primary designator. That's all you would see on a product on an American-made window in the States. If you looked at their performance rating label, you would see a class, performance grade, and a size tested, the size that that rating applies to. And, um, but you can also um, optionally append to that a description of the type of product it is, in this case, a fixed window. The other designator is, was designed for Canada. It was designed to report the additional properties that we've always been able to report in Canadian codes on Windows. Our B and C ratings, I guess you could say, our ABCs. So um, your secondary designator has positive and negative design pressure, water penetration resistance test pressure, and Canadian air infiltration exfiltration rating. The Canadian air tightness ratings under NAFs are more stringent than those in the U.S. So you have to meet a minimum level to qualify a product under NAFs in the U.S., but you have to actually reach a higher level of air tightness to give it one of the Canadian infiltration exfiltration ratings. So the secondary designator was designed to capture the additional things that were needed for Canadian code compliance. And and uh, a secondary designator, it's mandatory in Canada, optional in the U.S. Don't want to bore you with the details, but essentially this is what would show up on a Canadian window or door performance rating label. You would expect to see a primary designator followed by a secondary designator and some statement that it conforms to our NAFS standard and the Canadian supplement. 
So something along those lines. And the formatting may change, but that type of information needs to appear, and it always must appear in the same order. Your primary designated with your class, performance grade, and size tested, and then your design pressure, water pressure, and air, and so on. So again, this is uh, just for your information. Most of you won't be looking at these labels too closely, but should you see them, at least you'll know what you're looking at and what should be there uh, when you do so. Something I haven't put into the presentation, but something you should know is that there are Canadian requirements within the NAF standard. Not everything was harmonized between Canada and the U.S. There are some things that Canada had that were more stringent than the U.S. And so for a product to be sold in Canada, if it's made in the U.S. and qualified for NAFs in the U.S., that does not qualify it for Canadian code compliance. It must be also tested to the Canadian air infiltration, exfiltration rating, ease of operation, and several other tests. And it has to be labeled with both primary and secondary designators. And an American NAFS test does not give you all the information you need to, uh, to comply with this requirement. So American-made products do need to be either retested for sale in Canada, or if the manufacturers were smart and intending to export to Canada, they would have pre-tested them for both markets. Because our requirements are more stringent, of course, Canadian-tested products can be sold in the U.S. as they are. When it comes to labeling guidelines, if anyone's interested in Canadian NAFS labeling, there is a document uh, developed with industry consensus representing uh, parties across Canada. It was issued in November of 2013 and uh, clarifies the Canadian labeling guidelines for code compliance. And that was necessary because many American companies did not know what to do for Canadian compliance. And even Canadian building officials and even window manufacturers, door manufacturers, are new to this new regime. So these guidelines were developed for that purpose. So that covers off NAFs. We've put that aside. New terminology, new rating system, new designations to describe it. The next question is, how do we perform determine performance grades? The building code tells us to use NAFs together with this Canadian supplement in Part 9 and in Part 5. And it goes on to clearly say in both Part 5 and Part 9, and this is something that we've never had clearly stated in a Canadian code before. And it's this. Performance grades for windows, doors, and skylights shall be selected according to the Canadian supplement referenced in Clause 1B so as to be appropriate for the conditions and geographic location in which the window, door, or skylight will be installed. So this is new. We used to think, what's the minimum for code compliance? A1, B1, C1. Anywhere in Canada, right? No. That, that's what people thought was the case. But the code is saying, no, 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 no. There is no minimum requirement that applies everywhere. The windows and doors on every building in Canada need to be selected for the environment that building is in. If it's in a dry area, it'll need less water penetration resistance than if it's in a high moisture index area. If it is in a high wind load area, it's going to need much more structural wind load resistance than it does if it's in a sheltered area. So we are supposed to make determinations that are geographically specific, building specific, to determine what level of performance we need for that building. And then it says, windows, doors, and skylights shall conform to these performance grades when tested in accordance with the harmonized standard. So we have now been given a challenge that has kind of been implicit in the code because we've had a Canadian supplement equivalent in the code since the mid-90s. It was called the user guide to the A440 OO standard, A440-2000, A440-94. That process was there, but it was never explicit that we had to use it. And now it is so explicit, whether you're doing a complex building under part three or five, or whether you're doing a part nine building, you have to take this into account. This doesn't make life easy for anyone. 
So the code tells us to use the supplement, A440S109, to determine these properties for the building's location, exposure, and height. And as a specifier, you must also choose a preferred air infiltration, exfiltration level. The code minimum is A2 for operable products and fixed for non-operable products. And these properties, of course, have to appear on Canadian performance rating labels, whether they be removable or permanent. So we determine these properties using the Canadian supplement. And this is the thing, if you are involved in specifying windows and doors or choosing them as a designer, you should have a copy of the Canadian supplement so you can make the appropriate determinations. And I think this will become even more clear as we progress. You can't do the, your job without that information unless you rely completely on your consultants to provide that information to you. You need to consider the location and the code and the supplement provide environmental data for over 600 locations across Canada. You have to consider the height above grade of the fenestration element you're talking about. Um, you know, if it's a five-story building, you'll probably want all your windows to be the same on all five floors. But technically, as you go higher up, the wind loads get higher. The driving rain, rain wind pressure gets higher. So at some point, it is sometimes makes sense economically to have different requirements on a, on a large building. But the height above grade is critical for wind load effects. The other thing that you need to consider is the terrain. Open terrain, rough terrain, or something in between. And why is that important? Well, if you're in open terrain, you are standing on a flat plain or beside a lake or an ocean, and there's nothing protecting you from the wind you're getting 100% of the wind load that the code says is there. Rough terrain is when you're surrounded with buildings and plantings and things that break that wind up and provide some shelter so you have a lower level of wind load either structurally or driving rain through your windows and doors. So the terrain definition is important for knowing what kind of wind load is going to be required for the building. In my workshops, I do, I do a hands-on workshop with people using the Canadian supplement, using examples such as this. Determine the performance grade and water test pressure for replacement windows on this eight-story apartment building in Penticton. Specific building, specific location. And so, you know, the first step is to determine what's the height of the windows and doors. Well, we'll make them all the same for the whole building. It's 25 meters, we'll say. We look at the terrain, we look at where it's located, and Google Maps is really helpful for this purpose, um, to determine whether it's in open, rough terrain, or something mixed in between. So the inputs you use in the Canadian Supplement, um, Canadian Supplement has a worksheet that you can use to do these calculations manually. Uh, it's not difficult to do at all, the form tells you exactly what to do step by step if you want to use the simplified method here. And in this particular project, um, you, your inputs would start out at a driving rain wind pressure of 80 pascals. That's what you'd find in the building code or the Canadian supplement. Um, and, and your hourly wind pressure is 0 0.45 kPa. And then when you factor that for the exposure and the building height, you end up with a performance grade and a water test pressure. And I, I can't go through that process with you, but that's what you do using the Canadian supplement. Um, here's another example of another building. In this case, it's, it's a, a clear case of rough terrain and a similar situation. You go from the basic data that is provided in the code to a performance grade for the fenestration products. And of course, after people have done a few hands-on exercises, I say, isn't there an easier way to do this? And they, they, they say, yeah, there's got to be an easier way to do this, even though it's not hard. Um, and there is. We now have several online performance groups offered to do this for you. Um, makes it easier for all parties to determine performance grades. Manufacturers, suppliers, salespeople, building officials. Um, there's two calculators available in BC. There's another one uh, in Ontario, put together by Fenestration Canada. And um, 
I'll just show you some of them here. There's one QAI Labs here in BC has a calculator. Uh, and you can just do a search for something like QAI and Performance Grade Calculator. You'll find it. It's not hard on the internet. And essentially, you can input the values. You pick your province, your location, the height, the terrain, product class, and, and it, it does the, the calculations for you. Um, and there you go. You input those variables for that previous example, 25 meters, open terrain, residential. You need a PG35 and a water penetration of 260 in this case. So this makes the job easier, somewhat. Um, here's another one. This is the Fenestration Canada performance grade calculator. Um, this one has the advantage that it has a, an area where you can actually put in some project notes and generate a printed report of what it is that you've come up with in the way of a performance rating. So you can have a, a printed document that will record your selections here. So these calculators do simplify the performance grade selection. Um, however, you need to realize the limitations of supplement because it doesn't cover everything everywhere. And on top of that, the way the calculators are built, they can give you slightly different results. So with that, we'll step into the next section of our talk, which is the appropriate use and limitations of the Canadian supplement. You should know its use and limitations when you read it. Unfortunately, I believe it was written by engineers because it's not until you get halfway through it and start reading the definition of the exposure factor CE that an engineer would realize, ah, I see, this applies only to level ground. It doesn't apply to hills, slopes, or escarpments. I've got to go to part four of the building code to figure out how to calculate those. The rest of us don't understand that. And so it would be very helpful if the Canadian supplement had an introductory section that helped people to use it more wisely. Um, so these limitations are not obvious to casual readers. And we've also discovered that it has some errors. Um, one of them was that the environmental data, the, the hourly wind pressures and driving rain wind pressures were in the, this 2009 supplement were from the 2005 code. The supplement was published before the 2010 National Building Code and so that information got out of sync. And the supplement was republished in July of 2013 with the corrected data. You'd think that would be good news, right? Unfortunately, the building code in BC only recognizes 